Year-end interviews, people look at very closely for exactly what the right. Prime Minister of the day says, especially so in a year before an election right. is scheduled. Um, so let me get a couple of those kind of questions out of the way quickly. October 19th, should we assume that is when the election will be, or yes. is there anything that could change that? Well, I, don't, I won't say there's nothing that could change it, but there's nothing on the horizon that I see changing that. We fixed that date and we're, we're planning on it like everybody else. So when people talk about, oh, well, he's going to go in the spring, uh, we should ignore yeah, that? No, yeah, you should, and I always note that it's, it's either divining my mind or the, or the comments of some anonymous so-called strategist somewhere whose existence I don't know of. So I have no idea. I can honestly tell you we've had no discussion at any level of changing the date. So I don't know where that's coming from. And what about you personally? Because that's the other half of the equation. Yeah, I Will see, he or won't he? I see that sometimes too, but I think I've been very clear for some time now that it's my intention to lead the party once again. And, uh, and uh, look, I, uh, I'm looking forward to the to the debate and uh, think we have a pretty good chance. So you're clearly not somebody who believes in term limits of any kind. <laughs> I think term limits are up to the voter. Um, you know, look, uh, Peter, the way I look at it is this, I still, uh, lo you know, I still love the job. I, I enjoy the job. I tell people I've got the best job in the best country in the world. I think we've got the country on the right track, but I'd like to take some more time to really put it on that track in a very permanent way. I've spent uh, the last few days looking through some of your speeches over the time you've been in office since mm -hmm. 2006, and one of the constants one sees right from the first speech you gave overseas in England in 2006 uh, was your vision of Canada as an energy superpower. Right. Now I wonder here eight and a half years later about uh, the success of that vision because as you've always said, you've got to be able to get your product to market. Right. Nothing has really changed on that front. The pipelines that you've wanted uh, approved and built haven't happened, mm -hmm. uh, either at home or south of the border. Uh, the price has uh, collapsed on oil. Is the vision still there, or is it a failed vision? Well, look, what I tell people, and this is just a fact, um, Canada's obviously, to begin with, probably the most maybe the, the most energy secure country in the world. Whatever the energy mix of the future is, Canada will be a major supplier. Obviously, the, the, uh, the diversification I'd like to see hasn't happened, but you know, in fairness, Peter, we don't, you know, as a government of Canada, we don't direct the marketplace, and we don't uh, kind of personally or as a government approve projects. That's ultimately done through a scientific and environmental evaluation process. Those processes are ongoing. I'm, but are you I'm, frustrated by uh, the fact that, it, that here, all these years later, it hasn't happened? Well, look, um, I think it's ultimately up to the marketplace. Um, you know, I think the energy sector itself um, has, has had a pretty good run. There's lots of demand everywhere I go. Um, elsewhere in the world, people want Canadian LNG, people want Canadian oil. But people if you would can't like get to find out them. ways. Well, I think I think it's inevitable that that will happen. But there is a market process and there is a scientific evaluation process, and those are directed by others. Well, one of the people that it is directed by, south of the border, is the President of the United States. And one wonders, even on a day like this, where clearly the relationship between Canada and the U.S. has paid off on the on, on the Cuba front. Um, but one wonders where the two of you are on, on Keystone in terms of the conversations you have. I mean, we've watched him. He was even on late night television in the States uh, in the last couple of weeks, basically making fun of Keystone in some ways, but, but suggesting, listen, it just, you know, the, the, it's a pipeline across the U.S. to take <coughs> Canadian oil uh, to other markets overseas. Right. And the number of jobs permanent that it creates is minimal. Yeah. Now, when you hear that, what do you think? Well, look, uh, he knows our position, but uh, what I would say, Peter, is the interesting debate there is not the debate between President Obama and Canada. It's the debate between President Obama and the American people, who are overwhelmingly in favor of the project, and whose own government evaluations and State Department, et cetera, say very different things about the project in terms of what it brings, in terms of jobs, uh, energy security. Um, I think the and the environment, frankly. I think that's all pretty clear. We have won the argument of public opinion across the board in the United States. But do States you think it's this. unlikely that Keystone will be approved in the life of the Obama administration? I don't know that. I think we, I don't know that. Uh, we have a whole new Congress um, with proponents now of Keystone overwhelmingly in charge in but both he parties. He'll veto in both it. parties. Time, time will tell. People say a lot of things when they're in negotiations. Um, we'll see. 
Let me get back to the uh, the price question because last week you made some headlines by saying that um, while you still maintained your promise that at some point uh, oil, the oil and gas industry will be regulated, that it would be crazy to be doing it now with the price somewhere around 60, I think at the time, lower now. If that's a crazy price, what, what is an acceptable yeah, price? Yeah, well, that's not quite what I said, Peter. First of all, what I said was actually what I've been saying for some time, which is that this is an industry that is integrated between Canada and the United States in North America. And what is crazy would be for us to impose costs only on our industry in a way that would not reduce emissions, but simply shift jobs and development to other parts of North America. That makes no sense. <clears throat> We've said for some time, it's very, very, very public, we're seeking a continental response on this particular question, not just with the United States. Uh, we'd like to see uh, Mexico uh, as well in it. But, um, but so look, why don't we propose something then? We have proposed something. What have we proposed? Well, the province of Alberta, <clears throat> excuse me, the province of Alberta itself already has a, it's one of the few GHG regulatory environments in the country. It has one. Um, I think it's a model on which you could, on which you could, uh, which you could go broader. This is but, the carbon levy? Uh, this is the tech fund uh, price carbon levy and, and the, uh, the, it's not a levy, it's a price and there's a tech fund in which, uh, in which uh, private sector makes investments. So look, that's what Alberta has done. That's a model that's available. But, you know, as I say, we're very open to see progress on this on a continental basis. When I said I looked through <coughs> your speeches, I found one from um, June of 2007 that you gave in, in Berlin that yeah. I found okay. quite interesting. I vaguely remember the event. It was your first trip to Berlin, yeah. you said in the speech. It was just, it was before, the, just before the G8 meeting. Just before the G8. And it was yeah. about climate change. Yeah. I want to remind you of a couple of your quotes because I want to see whether you still believe this fundamentally, that you, Stephen Harper, believe this. Climate change is perhaps the biggest threat to confront the future of humanity today. Hmm. Do you believe that? Um, I think it's a significant threat. Um, geez, where does it rank in terms of our economic challenges, in terms of the jihadism that we now face globally? It, it's still a, a big threat. But not necessarily the biggest threat. <clears throat> I don't know about that. I mean, since then we've had the global recession mm -hmm. and we've had the rise, you know, the kind of second phase rise of the, of the global terrorist movement. So I would put those up there as well. You also said we owe it to future generations, we as Canada, uh, when you're linking climate change to greenhouse gas emissions. We owe it to future generations to do whatever we can to address this world problem. We should make a substantial contribution to confronting this challenge. Talking the talk doesn't work right. anymore. It's time to walk the walk. Right. Have we done any of those things? Yeah. Um, look, for the first time in history, this, government, this country actually has GHG emissions that have been falling. Um, Will we and, make our targets of 2020? We've got more work to do, but our, our emissions are falling. Most um, people think you know, we can't make those targets. You know, previous government had... Anybody can go around talking about targets. What's the actual results? Ours have been going down. Other countries' emissions, for the most part, are going up. World emissions are going up. Canada's have not been going up. So, look, is there more that can be done? I think so, absolutely. But as I've said all along, Peter, the only way to tackle this is with a, uh, an international protocol that, that it takes in all emitters. And that is now, frankly, that was a lone voice back in 2006, 2007, and that was the mantra of just about every developed country, at least. But doesn't somebody have to take bold action? I mean, the no, every, Secretary no, every, General. Everybody, everybody has to take bold action. But, but it's, it, it's as if everybody's sort of sitting on the sidelines waiting for somebody else to take bold action so they all take it together. Well, I don't, I don't think that's Doesn't true. Doesn't somebody have to start No, it? look, I don't think that's true. Um, let's take Canada. We have one of the cleanest emitting electricity sectors in the world. We have taken further steps. We are phasing out in Canada through regulation. We are phasing out the use of traditional dirty coal. This is the biggest single greenhouse emitting, greenhouse gas emitting source in the world, this coal-fired electricity. So if others would just follow our lead, we'd have this problem solved. Um, you mentioned jihadism uh, as, as one of the other issues. So we're, Canada is, is in the war on ISIS. Yeah. Um, and when you, you talk to those who have been conducting uh, the operations in Iraq, they suggest that the target-rich environment is now 
target poor, but most of the targets have been knocked out. That if you want targets, you've got to go to Syria now. Mm -hmm. Canada, as of this moment, <coughs> is not involved on the Syrian front. Right. Is that going to change? Um, haven't made a final decision on that. Certainly, um, as I said in the House of Commons, our, um, our view is that uh, ISIL is a real serious threat um, to the world and by implication to this country. And we want to do what we can to fight it and certainly to, A, to stop its growth, which I think is kind of happening, and then to roll this, this terrible uh, menace back. And um, hitting it in Syria is a very real uh, option. As you know, some of our allies have done that. But what we're very, Why clear, wouldn't on, we? what we're very, very clear on is we don't want anything that's interpreted as a war on the government of Syria. We're invited by the government of Iraq into Iraq. We're doing that. That's, that's why we're there. Syria is a little trickier, and uh, this government has, you know, regardless of what differences, as you know, we have condemned with everyone else the uh, Assad government, but we have no desire to enter in a war with any government in that country, and so that makes this situation a bit tricky. But you're still pondering it. It, it. These are options. We're continuing to look at options as we go forward, but we haven't taken a final decision. Where do you think you are on the six-month issue? Is that part of trying to decide whether to no, we'll, push we'll evaluate. Six in six months, we'll, you know, as we approach that date, Peter, we'll evaluate the mission and decide you know, what is it we don't need to keep doing and what other things maybe should we do instead. You've uh, watched as uh, there have been uh, incidents in a number of countries, including Canada, but yeah. Australia the, uh, the, the most recent. Um, do you think that the decision to be involved in the conflict in against ISIS, ISIL, put Canadians at undue risk as a result of that? No. Um, look, I think, it, let's be very clear on this, we're not, we're not at risk from ISIL because we're fighting them. We're fighting them because we are at risk from them. We've had numerous terror plots dealt with both very publicly and not so very publicly in this country. So these are real threats to the country. I think, I think Canadians understand that, which is why they're so supportive of us uh, taking these guys on. But look, that will, they, that's, that's their next line, where we're only attacking you because you're, you're standing up to us. The incidents that I mentioned, at the moment they were happening, yeah. it would be hard to determine exactly what was happening, who was behind these, how involved ISIS or ISIL right. might be. Um, when we've looked at them, the difference between the Canadian and the other incidents is as a leader, you were right there. You were yeah. there when it happened. Yeah, one of them anyway. One of them. Um, but we've never heard your story. What was it like in that room? There was a gunman well, on the other side of the door, and there was a lot of shooting going on. You know, Peter, um, I, as you know, I don't spend a lot of time talking about myself. Um, uh, at a time like that, my first responsibility, and you know, I've told you we're, we're received some training to deal with these kinds of situations. My first, over, first responsibility is to extricate myself from such a situation so I can continue the normal functions of government and obviously extraordinary functions on a day like that. I don't need to tell you that for everybody in Parliament that day, not just our caucus, the other caucuses, the staff and employees, it was uh, an experience no one wants to repeat. And obviously, our, all our various police and security agencies uh, on the hill, off the hill, are going over the details of that to, to uh, reach some conclusions on how they can uh, better prevent and better respond to such incidents in the some future. Some of the people who were in that room and in the other caucus room, that, that, that they were afraid for their lives at that moment when they heard what was going on outside that door. Yeah, that's a fact. That's beyond a doubt, so absolutely beyond a doubt. What was going through your mind? I mean, what were you hearing? Um, look, as I, everybody knows, we were, uh, you know, I told people we were, we were in a caucus room. You see on, on the video, you see security people having a firefight chasing a gunman down the hall. You're in the caucus room there. All you hear is a whole lot of shooting coming towards you. And you don't know whether that's a firefight or whether that's just a bunch of guys with automatic weapons wiping everybody out in their path. So you don't know what that is, but obviously uh, I think it's fair to say that uh, for everybody in the room, um, we were pretty concerned. Were you scared? You know, I, I, I think I've mentioned to you, I've been trained in instances like that. Obviously, you get keyed up, but... Um, what does it mean you were trained? 
Well, the RCPs run me through some drills to simulate these kinds of situations. So, um, you know, as a prime minister, you're in a little bit different position of, of other people, Peter. Uh, you know, as prime minister, I have access, obviously, to all the government's intelligence, uh, all the security risks that are faced by the country and by me personally. So you, you're in a different headspace than most other people who are suddenly facing this kind of situation for the first time. Were you, as has been reported, put in a closet? Uh, you know, I'm not going to comment on that. Um, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the things uh, you try and do in a situation like that is conceal yourself if you can. Um, but obviously the best situation is to exit, uh, as I said, so that you can, so the Prime Minister can continue to run the government, and that's what we were able to do within a few minutes, fortunately. Who was the first person you called when you got out of there? I called my mom just to uh, assure her I was okay, and, uh, and uh, I could tell by her voice that she was concerned. She'd probably been watching all this. Yeah, she was watching it.